All right. In this particular video, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, some basic anatomic terms that you're going to be using uh, throughout my class if you're one of my students or if you're a student in another class throughout the duration of that, whether, you know, your class, whether it's through reading or the person lecturing. And these terms are not only going to be used, um, you know, academically while you're in school and learning about, you know, uh, clinical information in human anatomy and physiology or veterinary medicine as well. But these terms are just going to go with you for the rest of your life. You're going to be using these all the time in your career. And um, it's very important that you have a good working knowledge of these. And my advice to you guys as well, it's, it's going to be important that you actually start using these yourselves to ingrain these into your memory. For example, get into the habit of instead of saying in front of or the front of the body, start saying anterior or posterior or superior for above, inferior for below. So get in the habit of actually using these terms on a regular basis as much as you can. And that'll be a great way to really kind of bring home a, a good practical understanding and application of these terms. All right. So it's very important that you understand these words that I'm going to be going over. Now, why do we have to use these terms? I mean, doesn't it just sound easier to say on top of, in front of, behind, back, whatever? All right. Well, first off, you have to remember my, or remember in mind, bear in mind that medical terminology is a universal type of a language. You know, the, the, the bulk of medical terminology is Latin with some Greek, uh, a little bit of German, a little bit of French uh, mixed in there. Uh, you know, the bulk of it being Latin, you know, and again, Latin is used in science because it's a dead language. You know, no country speaks it as a first language anymore. So by you, so that allows for medicine in terms of the, the, the language side of things to be universal, you know, regardless of what country you're in, uh, what area you're in and so on. So it's very important that you understand these terms, you know, because like I said, I mean, if, if you're in a different country, uh, you know, anterior is anterior, anterior is in front of, you know, towards the front. All right, and so on. So there's something you have to keep in mind as to why it's important that you need to use these words. And as I mentioned before, these are terms that are just commonly, you know, not commonly, they're just always used academically and clinically. And if you have a good professor, a good instructor, or a good teacher, depending on what educational level you're at, they will also be using these terms on a regular basis just to ingrain it into your heads so you you know, for you guys to continuously use these all the time. Okay, you know, academically, you know, for in my class, uh, you know, in anatomy and physiology one, we dissect brains. Um, sheep brains do some comparative anatomy between human and sheep brains. You know, because there are, you know, I mean, there's a, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of structures that are very, very similar to human brains. And it's a great way to get a good three-dimensional view of a brain, you know, and, you know, even though we don't have very good access to humans. All right. So, um, you know, so I'll give different groups of students uh, brains and I'll say, okay, you guys need to do a mid-sagittal section. You guys need to do a coronal sections or sections. You guys need to make a transverse cut. All right. And, you know, by the time we get to I me, mean, that's pretty far into the term that we're doing that. And by the time we get to that point in time, you shouldn't be looking at me like a deer in headlights, you know, when I say do a mid-sagittal cut. If you don't know what's going on by then, then either I've wronged you in some way or you've wronged yourself by not actually taking the initiative to make these words stick. All right. So, you know, and, and, you know, and then when I lecture, I just use these words all the time. You know, when I, especially when we get to A and P2, we're talking about the respiratory system. Okay. Oops. I have the, I have it set on the eraser. You know, when we lecture about, you know, the trachea and then the esophagus is behind the, you know, is, is behind or posterior to the trachea and the vertebral column is posterior to all of that. All right. So it's very important that you understand that the trachea is anterior or in front of the esophagus. Okay. And so on. So academically, these terms are used a lot by whether you're in a lab or a lecture. And then and again, clinically, these terms are used all the time as well. You know, these are terms that are used to describe, you know, especially when you're looking at uh, various uh, scans or in surgery, you know, when you're trying to get various views of organs or making certain cuts and so on. I mean, you know, 
by the time you get to that point in time where you're in the in, in actually in the workforce, you shouldn't be looking at you know when you're given orders to do something and these terms are used. You again, you shouldn't be looking at them like a deer in headlights because I don't want them calling me saying, "Hey, are you the idiot that taught these students this?" Okay, you know because it, you know it's very important that you know these terms just because of how often they are used. Okay, now before we get into uh, actually talking about first the anatomic planes and then some basic uh, directional terms, you have to understand this concept, anatomic position. Okay, now what anatomic position is, this is kind of a central frame of reference that allows us to kind of have a, just have a an actual well like i said a frame of reference to use these terms okay because we, the body can be positioned in many different ways and we can you know certain structures can be viewed as in front of or behind you know and that could change depending on how the how body position changes but if we have one kind of universal body position then we also have you know that frame of reference that, that we can apply these terms to and they're not really going to change all that much all right and this is what anatomic position is. Now, this is uh, me here in this picture. And uh, what anatomic position... Now, now if you were to describe um, how I'm actually standing in this position, how would you describe this? You know, what would you notice about how, how I'm standing there? You know, the first thing you should point out is that I am standing, you know, erect or upright. Okay, when you're in an anatomic position, you are standing erect. Okay, the next thing you should point out is that everything is facing forward. Everything is facing forward. You can see the palms of my hands are facing forward. Okay, you can see my gaze is facing forward. My feet, for the most part, sorry about that, are facing forward. Okay, you're getting a view, you know, everything is facing forward. Okay, so standing erect facing forward and notice how the palms are again facing forward that's important the palms have to be facing forward while you're in this position okay the feet are about shoulder width apart okay they're about shoulder width apart and notice how the arms are at the sides okay that is anatomic position okay standing erect Everything facing forward, feet, palm, feet in the palms of the hands included. All right. Uh, the arms at the sides and feet about shoulder, shoulder width apart. Okay. That is, so now this is your frame of reference again for using these terms. So if you want to talk about an object being in front of or behind another object, then this, you kind of come back to this position and think about, okay, well, if I'm in an anatomic position, well, then the, uh, the trachea is um, in front of or anterior to the esophagus. The thumb is the lateral or the outside digit of the hand, while the pinkies are the medial or inside digits of the hand. Okay, you get the picture. One last thing that I want to mention is that when you're thinking about this as well, you have to think that there is an imaginary line drawn down the center of our body. And this imaginary line is called the midline. Okay, this is going to be important in a little while when we come back to talking about some directional terms and how we talk about, well, what is further out to the side and what is closer to the middle. All right, and again, these terms are very important. You know, all these terms and, and, and planes are important to understand, but you always have to come back to anatomic position when you're thinking about where different body parts are located in relation to one another. Okay, so this is anatomic position, and now let's talk about the anatomic planes, okay? What the anatomic planes are, these are imaginary planes that divide either the body or body parts into various regions. And, and these are important because these allow us to look at the exact same body parts or the body itself from different perspectives. You know, for example, in uh, Anatomy and Physiology 1, my students are going to, as I mentioned, are going to be dissecting brains, sheep brains. All right. And these are the terms I'm going to be using when I say when I tell one group you need to make a you know a coronal cut, another group you need to make a mid sagittal cut, another group you need to make transverse cuts because you know body parts and you know have 
you know, you know, the heart or the, well, I'll just stick with the brain since I'm on that. You know, the brain, for example, has a lot of different parts with it that you can, you know, view just by, you know, doing a gross anatomy lab like that. Okay, but some of these parts, you're either not going to get a full appreciation of in terms of what they do based on their design, or you just may not even see from different angles. Okay, so by making these certain cuts, the, you know, this allows us to view various parts uh, from different perspectives. And I'll show you some examples uh, as we go uh, throughout this presentation. And again, from a clinical perspective, from scanning perspectives, you know, when you're, you know whether you're you know, MRI, CT scan or whatnot, um, you know, there are, you know, if you want to get a, a, a scan of a joint, like a shoulder or the knee, you know, I've had a couple of knee MRIs myself, um, you know, there are many different angles you can take a look at that knee to figure out, well, where is this pain coming from? Where is the injury taking place? How bad is the actual injury? You know, me, I blew my ACL out twice, and I saw the scans on both of those, and boy, did it look ugly because I really blew it out. But, you know, there, but, you know, let's say there was only a partial tear in that thing. You know, I may not be able to see from one angle where the tear was, but from another angle I may. Okay, so... So these planes, as you can see right here, this is typically the classical picture that's used to show um, the the anatomic planes. Now there's a fourth one as well, and that fourth one would be the oops would be the mid. I'm just going to put mid in front of it, mid sagittal plane. So there's sagittal, mid sagittal, coronal, and transverse. Okay. Now I'll tell you right now, just by by using this picture, and then I'll go to some examples. Um, you know, the, sag the, the, the mid-sagittal plane, remember that imaginary midline I was just talking about, going straight down the middle of the body? Okay, the mid-sagittal plane would divide the body into equal left and right portions, whereas a sagittal cut would divide the body into unequal left and right portions. So if I want to do, I don't know, dissect an arm, or if I want to, well, let's, let's say dissect, let's say scan a shoulder. Okay, if I want to, you know, if I want to scan a shoulder, you know, in an MRI, you're going to take some sagittal views of that. But obviously, the body's not going to be in equal left and right portions, as you can see here. Okay, so that's sagittal and mid sagittal. The coronal plane would be this one here. All right, and this divides the body into anterior, posterior, or front and back portions. All right. And then the transverse plane divides the body into uh, top and bottom or superior and inferior portions or a body part as well. It doesn't always just have to be the human body. Okay, so let's kind of keep that in mind. So the anatomic planes. So if we kind of look at the left here. Um, oops, that's not what I want to talk about. Um, so, if we, so if I take a look in the left here, you know, let's say I, I don't know, I need to have an abdominal scan. Okay, and, uh, you know, I, I had some pain presenting in, in a certain area of my abdomen. You know, they may want to do a transverse, you know, set, you know take, a, take a transverse view and then actually see how all the body parts, you know, they can see all the body parts in there, you know, kidneys, you can see where the liver is and all that stuff. Um, and then let's say there was a mass or a tumor or a lump in there somewhere. This would be a good idea. This would be a good way to kind of take a look in relation to, you know, the other body parts where this mass actually is. Or, for example, when we get to the heart, you know, when we dissect hearts, uh, a good way to kind of take a look at what are called the AV valves or atrial ventricular valves um, you know, is to cut off the upper chambers called the atria of the heart and look down into the atria and actually see how many leaflets are on these valves because these valves are named based on how many leaflets there are. There's one that's called tricuspid, and there's another that's called bicuspid. Then this is a really good way to take a look at that as well. All right, or with the brain. This is a good way to take a look at some views of the brain, and I'll show you that in a second. So this, in my opinion, is the easiest one, the transverse plane. Because again, all you're doing is you're just dividing a body, a body structure, a body part into um, uh, it's superior, inferior, or top and bottom portions. Now you have to bear in mind that th that these cuts don't have to be equal. Okay, you know, when you're taking a transverse view of something, the the the, the view does not, you know, the, the body part or the body itself does not have to be divided into equal portions. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the coronal plane uh, would divide the body into 
uh, front and back portions. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be equal front and back portions. Okay. Now the coronal plane, um, you know, a, a good example of this is, I mean, everybody in here has done this at some point in time, whether you've cooked or whether you've sliced bread. Okay. Because let's say you're, you're chopping up a carrot. Okay. You're chopping up a carrot to put in soup. Okay. You know, it's section, 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 Oops, marker is going crazy. Section, um, and then you take those pieces of the carrot and you put it in the soup. Okay, if you're slicing bread, you know you slice bread from you know top to bottom, 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 and then you have all these slices of bread to make a sandwich with. And when you you know you know when you say, oh, I want to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, well, let's lop off the you know the, the entire length of the top of the bread, and then another length. Wow, that'd be a I mean, that'd be a heck of a sandwich to eat. Okay, and we have enough weight problems as it is in this country as is. We don't need to be doing that. Um, so, so that essentially is the coronal plane, dividing the body into front and back portions or a body part. Okay, and again, you you this is a very common type. Of, you know, from a scanning perspective, you see this very commonly done with the head. Okay, you know, if you're looking for a tumor or a mass with a head CT or a head MRI, um, you know, you, you know, you can kind of go start from you know very anteriorly or superficial with the with the with the head and then work your way deeper into the scan and then see um, various parts you know look at the various parts of the brain and try to find those tumors or masses and whatnot okay so that's uh transverse and coronal and then here so what is that an example of right there uh would this be mid-sagittal or sagittal You know, obviously that's mid-sagittal. Remember, I said that there's an imaginary line going straight down the middle of the body. All right, and if we were to divide the body straight down that midline, the body would be divided into equal left and right portions. Okay, whereas a sagittal plane or a sagittal section would be would divide a body part or the body into unequal left and right portions. Okay, so that's essentially how sagittal and mid-sagittal work. And this is also important for you kinesiology students that are out there. Hopefully, you know, if there's uh, anybody here taking a kinesiology class, they're going to have to. You have to understand that these planes are important to know as well because, you know, when you're talking about uh, kind of the biomechanics of movements, you know, you have to understand that some of these movements are going to occur throughout the various planes. And if you don't understand how the body is, how the body itself is divided in these various planes, or you get this terminology backwards, you're going to really kind of, you know, not understand this and bomb your test. And, uh, you know, but that's not the important part. The important part is understanding this material and actually being able to use it. Okay, I mean, you could fail a test, but, uh, you know, if you walk out of that test, even though you failed it, but but that concept sticks with you later on, that's what counts. That's what's important. Okay, and that's what's important as well, you know, that you know these concepts. So let's take a look at some examples. Um, you know, that's, you know, these are uh, some images that I took, uh, you know, from uh, my students that were dissecting uh, body, you know, the, the brains that I mentioned earlier. And this would be an example of a transverse section. Okay, so right here, what they did was, is, you know, they took the brain and then they, they I had them section off a couple different, you know, do it, you know, in a couple different slices just to be careful as they're working their way down. And then what they were able to do, they were able to get an interesting view of the lateral ventricles and then also the choroid plexus, the capillaries that are found inside these lateral ventricles. Okay. And then if you cut a little deeper and do a right, you can almost look down into the third ventricle as well. But that's a little tricky without doing a lot of damage. Okay. Uh, it, it, I apologize. I know I sound like I have the sniffles. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful autumn right now, but uh, I uh, uh, when it gets real dry, my late season allergies tend to kick up. So I apologize for that. Um, but again, the transverse plane, you just you know this brain was divided into unequal you know top and bottom portions, but this allowed us to get a good view of the lateral ventricles. Okay, here would be a coronal section. The body, you know, the brain was divided into front and back portions and they literally sliced the brain like you would a loaf of bread. Um, and then from different, you know, again, you can see different structures at different, you know, at, at different levels of the brain because the hypothalamus of the brain, which is normally if you're kind of more towards the anterior part of the, the anterior middle part of the brain, you know, front middle, um, you know, you're going to see this kind of deepened mass of gray matter 
and around the third ventricle right here, and you can get a good view of that. But if you go too far to the front or too far to the back of the brain, well, you're not going to see that anymore. You know, also, um, so so this allows us to see different centers of the brain from different perspectives. Now, I like, you know, what I like as well is that this, see this little kind of band of white tissue right there, the corpus callosum, that's a structure of the brain that connects the two cerebral hemispheres together. And, you know, it's kind of the highway of, inf you know, kind of the highway of communication between the two hemispheres. And so basically there are nerve pathways that pass from one side to the other. All right. And what, this is kind of a good way to see how, how this piece of tissue here actually literally connects the two hemispheres of the brain. It's kind of cool. All right. So that would be an example of a coronal section with the brain. And then here, this would be a mid-sagittal, or this would be a brain that was divided directly down the middle, okay, into equal left and right portions. And again, you know, this allows us to take a look at either the same or different structures from a different perspective. Okay, here, again, is that corpus callosum, the same structure I just mentioned, but you can kind of see the full view of it, how long it is. Okay, the last picture, you saw how it actually physically connected the two hemispheres. Now this gives you an appreciation for how long the corpus callosum actually is. Okay, here's another perspective of the lateral ventricles. Okay, this right here is called the aqueduct of Silvius or the cerebral aqueduct. You couldn't see it in any of the other perspectives. And that's very important, you know, when you talk, you know, that's an important structure to know when we talk about the ventricles of the brain and how cerebral spinal fluid uh, circulates throughout the central nervous system. Okay, you know, here, this white matter in the cerebellum, you weren't able to see that in any, any of the other perspectives. And this is the best way to get a good, uh, good view of, of how it actually looks like and how it's organized. And I think it allows you to appreciate appreciate its name a little better as well, the arbor vitae, okay, arbor meaning tree, okay, this looks like a leaf or a bunch of, you know, a few trees in here, all right, you can see the different levels of the brainstem, the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain, all right, you can see what would be the equivalent of the thalamus, I mean, you can see what's left of the optic chiasm, I mean, you can, again, you can just see from this mid-sagittal a lot of the structures that are that are in this brain, and again, from an academic point of view, this is how these anatomic planes are going to come in handy, and it's important, why it's important that you need to understand these, and like I said, from a clinical perspective, you know, again, I, I gave plenty of examples as to why they're important, okay? So anatomic terms. So now these anatomic terms are going to be important to know because the, what these anatomic terms are essentially doing is is these are all about directions and getting and and getting the right bearings. Okay, so you're going to learn about you know anterior, posterior, ventral, dorsal, superior, inferior, medial, lateral, proximal, distal, superficial, deep. Um, and so basically these terms are very simple, but these are the technical terms to say that something is in front of or behind, you know, towards the belly or towards the, you know, the back itself, above or below, in towards the middle or towards the sides, points of attachment closer to origin or farther away, okay, deeper in the, or, or uh, closer to the surface of the body or deeper in the body. Okay, that's what the, so, so these are specific terms to describe very general ways we would more than likely use to describe certain topics. But again, it's important that you use these words because, you know, this is the universe, remember, you have to think of the universal aspect of medicine here, okay? So let's talk about the first two. Again, these are relatively simple, um, you know, anterior and posterior. Now, anterior means either in front of or towards the front, Okay, in front of or towards the front. All right, and obviously this would be if I this is a side view of anatomic position. This would be the front or the anterior perspective of my body. All right, and then so then the opposite would be posterior. All right, and then you can see the back of my hat, the Green Bay Packers, Super Bowl champions of last year is facing the back. Sorry, I had to throw that in. This is a great year for Wisconsin sports, and I'm going to revel in it. Um, but uh, but again, so front, you know, towards the anterior front, posterior um, towards the back. Okay, or, or I'm sorry, anterior um, in front of, posterior behind. Okay, now this is this is why you have to understand those terms in the way I describe them. Ventral and dorsal. Ventral means towards the belly. Okay, dorsal, think dorsal, the back itself. 
Okay, dorsal is a very easy one to remember because if you've ever you know seen a shark or whether it's a picture in real life or a dolphin, um, you know that they have a dorsal fin, the fin on their back. Okay, a fin on their back. Now, being that I'm a bipedal animal, bipedal, you know, biped. That means I stand on two legs. All right. Now notice how ventral and anterior can more than likely be used, um, you know, interchangeably, which they often are used interchangeably with one another, and then dorsal and posterior. Okay, because obviously backside, posterior, dorsal, back, you can see how they're both on the same side. Same thing with ventral and anterior, both on the same side. Now, here's my crazy cat gizmo. How would you use these terms here? What is the most anterior and posterior part of gizmo? And where are the ventral and dorsal aspects of gizmo? Take a second to think about this. I'm going to leave you a moment of silence to think about this. Okay, if you still want to think, pause this and think for a second. Okay, but I'm going to, I'm going to show you where these are at, then I'm going to explain. Okay, just use the first letter of each word. Interior, dorsal, posterior, ventral. Okay, so if there's any veterinary students out here watching this, this is going to be important. Okay, so Gizmo, she's a quadruped. She stands on four legs. Okay, now this is where understanding the literal kind of uh, uh, definitions for these words comes in handy. Because um, remember, anterior means front. Okay, you know, where, you know, where is the frontal most aspect of the cat? Posterior means, you know, behind. Okay, dorsal literally means back. And ventral means belly. Okay, ventral means belly. Okay, so obviously the frontmost aspect of the cat would be her nose. Okay, would be her nose. Okay. The most posterior aspect of the gizmo, if she had her tail down, it would be the tip of her tail. But, you know, we'll just kind of stick with, you know, her, her behind. And, and, uh, and, we'll, and we'll throw her tail in there as well. Because, you know, that's the part of her body that's the farthest behind. Ventral, well, remember, an animal that stands on four legs, their belly faces the ground. Okay, so their belly is actually facing downward. So that's the ventral side. So ventral and anterior have to be used differently in this animal. And then dorsal, you know, you know, this would, uh, you know, this would be the actual back of the cat. Okay, so again, the, you know, this is facing differently than any human. You know, this is facing, you know, up towards the sky. All right, so that's the dorsal side of this animal here. All right, so so bear in mind that, you know, again, if you're a veterinary student watching this, that these terms are, you know, it's very important that you use these appropriately when you're talking about quadrupeds. Okay, and let's all give my cat a round of applause for being nice. And, uh, well, I guess I couldn't say she actually volunteered for this picture. It took me quite a few tries to even get this picture of her standing like this. But thank you, Gizmo. Okay. Um, so now next let's talk about superior and inferior. Okay. Superior and inferior. These are relatively easy as well. Superior literally means kind of towards the head. All right. Um, and, or above. Gosh, dang it. Above. Okay. And then inferior would mean below or towards the feet. Okay, so obviously the most superior portion of my body is being covered by my hat here, um, you know, would be my scalp. You know, a lot of people like to say hair, but hair growth actually begins underneath the skin. Um, so the, you know, the skin on the top of my head, uh, you know, the, the epidermis on the, on, the, on the top of my cranium here, that would be the most superior aspect of my body. And then the plantar surfaces or the bottoms of my feet would be the most inferior portions of the body. Now, again, important to understand because, you know, let's say, for example, we're talking about the kidneys. 
you know, the left kidney sits just a tad higher or is, a, is slightly superior to the right kidney because the liver is so big on the right side that it pushes it down a little bit. Okay, so, um, or if we say, if we're talking about the adrenal glands sitting on the superior aspects of the kidneys, okay, the, you know, the adrenal glands are like caps that sit atop the superior aspect of the kidneys. Okay, you know, again, you, you notice right there, I didn't say above or below, I said the, the adrenal glands are located on the superior aspect of the kidneys. Like I said, that's how these terms should be appropriately used. That's how you as a student should start using these. And, you know, uh, uh, like I said, a person who's, who's good at lecturing and actually cares about you appropriately knowing these words will use these as they lecture as well, not just say, well, the, you know, the, the, the adrenal glands are above or on top of the kidneys, they'll say the superior aspect. Inferior, you know, the gallbladder is located on the inferior side or inferior, inferior aspect of the liver. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so superior, inferior, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, medial and lateral. Okay, again, this is where that midline, and apologize for the marker hiccup again. Medial, lateral. This is where that midline really is going to come in handy here. Okay, medial means towards the middle. Okay. Medial means towards the middle. Lateral means uh, towards the sides or away, from, or you can think of, uh, you know, away from the body almost, as long as it's out to the side. Okay, and some structures in the body are going to be located more in the middle, while some are more on the lateral side. And again, this is where standing in anatomic position appropriately or just understanding this position comes in handy. Because, for example, if you were to take a look at the hand, what would be the most medial digit of the hand? When I say digit, I mean finger. Okay, that would obviously be the, you know, the, um, the fifth digit or your pinky. And then the most lateral digit would be your thumb or the first metacarpal or the first digit. Okay. Now think about this for a second. If I was to take my hand and I were to pronate it, if I were to rotate it inward and have it facing exactly in the opposite direction, you should be doing, you should do this yourself as you're watching right now. Well, what do you notice? Notice how we just did a complete 180 on this. Now the thumb is facing medially and the pinky is facing laterally. Okay, so see how this, how it's important to know this position as your frame of reference and that you don't change it or improvise and do anything on your own. Okay, but medial, lateral, that's, that's how they're used. Very simple. Medial means towards the middle. Lateral means out towards the sides. Okay. Um, now, these are terms that people get confused and it's understandable. And I think, you know, more or less this happens just because they're not explained appropriately. Um, proximal and distal. Now, proximal and distal also work in relation to, you know, to this midline. So let's just kind of put this midline back in the body here. All right. Um, okay. Now, proximal and distal, but, you know, so, you should, so, you, so basically proximal would also is, is a term to describe either towards this midline or kind of a point of origin. And distal would mean, you know, away from the midline or, or farther away from a, you know, kind of a point of origin. Okay. Now, so you're thinking, well, what is, you're probably sitting here thinking, well, what in the heck is the difference between proximal, distal, medial, lateral then? Well, you have to think about, think of proximal and distal as points of attachment. Gosh, dang it. Sorry, my marker has a mind of its own sometimes points of attachment. So are two or more objects attaching or coming together closer to the middle of the body or are they doing it farther away? Okay, and that's why I chose the skeleton here. All right, that's why I chose the skeleton because let's say we take a look at the humerus, okay, the bone in your arm. All right, the bone in your arm. What is more distal, the shoulder or the elbow? So this would be the shoulder, this would be the elbow. So 
Is it got a mind of its own again? Okay, which point of attachment is farther away from the midline? Well, the you know that would be the elbow. This would be the distal aspect of the humerus, and then this would be the proximal. I'm just going to abbreviate proximal. That would be the proximal aspect of the humerus. Okay. This would be the distal aspect of the clavicle. This would be the proximal aspect of the clavicle. Okay. These, you know, you know, obviously where the, you know, the most proximal points of attachment would be where the ribs meet the sternum and where the ribs meet the vertebrae or the vertebrae um, forming the joints in the back as well. Okay, so that's what proximal and distal means. Do, you know, where do, where are two or more objects coming together? Are they doing it farther away from the midline? And if they do so, that would be distal, like the elbow. Or are they doing it closer to the midline? They would be proximal, like the shoulder in this example that you see here. Okay, so that's proximal and distal. You have to think points of attachment. Where are two or more objects coming together, joining together, farther away or closer to the middle? And then the last set of terms that I want to talk about in this video are superficial and deep. Okay, and again, these are these are very easy as well. Um, superficial just means towards the surface. And deep, well, I think deep's pretty self-explanatory. Deeper, you know, farther in the body. Okay, so here's an example of a dissected eye. Okay, this would be, oh, okay, so normally the eye looks like this, right? Well, we've got a cornea sticking out there. <coughs> what type of a section do you think this is? Does it look like this audio that this eye was divided into front and back portions? Was it divided into superior, inferior, or was it divided uh, horizontally? This is a coronal section of the eye. Okay, a coronal section of the eye. Okay. All right, because now you might not, now by looking at this, you might be thinking, well, why is this not transverse? Well, remember, when we stand up, you know, here's your eyes and your orbital socket, and here's your skull. Okay, we are upright. The eyes are up and facing forward. Okay, so... If you cut the eye into front and back portions, then then that's what you get. If you were to lay the eyeball, if you were to pop an eye out of its head and lay it down and then do that, then yeah, that'd be transverse. But you have to remember your frame of reference, anatomic position. Okay, so this is a coronal section. Now, there are what are called, when we're looking at the eye, there are what are called the three tunics or tissue layers. Or tunics kind of mean wrappings or coverings of the eye. Okay, and there's what's called the fibrous tunic, the vascular tunic, and the neural tunic, um, or the kind of the connective tissue, the um, where you know which you know which layer is the connective tissue, which layer is the blood has the contains the blood vessels, and which layer is essentially the retina itself. Okay, so if we take a look at this eye, you know there you see this white of the eye that's called the sclera. Then you look at this black inside the eye, you know the 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 the, the that's called a choroid, and that is where you find one the pigment melanin and two the, the the vascular supply the blood vessel supply to the posterior aspect of the eye okay and then the which we can't see here because this isn't the right section of the eye um, the retina would be the deepest part of the eye okay so the the this white this outer portion of the eye this would be the most superficial Okay, because this is, I mean, when you look at somebody, you I mean, you see the whites of their eyes. You don't get much more superficial than that. Okay, when you can actually see it with your own two eyes. When you look at someone's skin, I mean, you know, the epidermis of the skin is about as superficial as you can get. Okay, and then when we say deep, you know, you weren't able to see this black aspect of the eye or, you know, without actually all this black, without actually cutting the eye in half to look inside, farther in deeper inside the eye okay so this choroid or this black tissue this black tunic of the eye is deeper in the eye and then the retina which is normally kind of a whitish cloudy color is on top of that choroid is it is deeper inside the eye than that okay so superficial just means toward the surface and deep just means farther within the body Okay, so now it's very important, as I mentioned, that you understand all these, you know, these anatomic planes and these terms, you know, watch these, you know, like, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, 
um, you know, after you're done watching this, start using these when you talk about, you know, what, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling you the student, actually use these terms when you're talking, when you're thinking, if you're working in a study group, if you're at, even if you're asking a question in class, well, is this superior to that or is this inferior to that? Because the more you use them, and there's nothing wrong with saying it incorrectly. That's what, you know, that's what we're here for. I mean, that's part of being a student. You're supposed to screw up. And, uh, you know, you're supposed to screw things up. That's why you go to school before you go, before you get the job. So you get educated, you make your mistakes. So when you get to the workforce, then, well, you get it, you have all that worked out. You're still going to make a mistake once in a while because we're human. But that's the point of going to school is to lower the chances of that happening. Okay. But like I say, to use this lingo, um, while you are uh, while you are actually studying this material, and as an ed and and if there are any educators watching this video, I strongly encourage the same out of you. Actually, use this when you're lecturing. Don't just say, "Well, this is above this, this is below that." Actually, say superior, inferior, medial, lateral. Use these terms so they can be ingrained in your students' heads. All right. So hopefully this video helped, um, and uh, I shall see you in another video.